Um, last week we wrapped up the last of the Psalms uh, regarding David's flight from Absalom or the Psalms that were believed to have been written about that time. We're going into new and uncharted territory here very quickly. Does anybody remember some stuff that we talked about from Psalm 28? Brother Larry. Uh, David was scared and prayed that he wouldn't be swept away with the wicked. That's true. Yep. Sister Donna. Uh, That's right. Yep. He said, um, I'm actually trying to, uh, I think it's ver verse 6, because he hath heard the voice of my supplication. He, and David David was happy that he, that he was able to speak directly um, with God. Um, anybody else? Hello? He uh, also prayed that he would be heard because sometimes he knew that he, he would not always be heard so he prayed that the Lord would listen to him. Right, yeah. He, uh, um, He uh, also state he also stated the uh, he, um, he said blessed be the Lord because he hath heard he hath heard the voice of my supplications and then he goes into from from seven eight and nine uh, praise for well seven eight praise to the Lord for his provision and then in verse nine something that's more more colloquial you know more I don't know what the right word is more. Um, uh, centered in on when this psalm was actually written, but it's uh, save thy people, bless thy inheritance, feed them also, and lift them up forever. So a small prayer for Israel, because Israel was going to come into a time um, after the um, defeat of Absalom, where um, things were going to be a little dis, you know, uh, unstable. They, I mean, it, for all intents and purposes, Israel was in a uh, a civil war there for. Uh, a, a hot minute. So, and, and he prayed for the uh, staying and sustenance of the. Yes, Brother Jerry. Verse 40. Absolutely. Verse 40. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, g uh, uh, give them according to their deeds. And David, David wanted reward to those people for the things they had done. And then we also talked about how that inadvertently, though. If David was at fault, reward would come to him as well. Uh, uh, God meets out punishment as needed uh, and as necessary, not as you know, not and with 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 a lack of discrimination. <laughs> I, I will say, um, and that brings us to Psalm twenty nine, an interesting little psalm in that it talks a lot about the power of the Lord. And it does it in a very musical fashion, or a very poetic fashion, in that it does it in the eyes of a storm rolling in from the Mediterranean Sea. Um, this psalm is largely a psalm of, of praise, of magnification, and seeing the power of God and not just seeing the power of God, but as it works in our in our physical world, and 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 how and how it affects it. So we'll begin in verse one here. Uh, give unto the Lord, ye mighty. Give unto uh, give unto the Lord glory and strength. David opens the psalm up with a request to the people of God to give unto the Lord glory and strength. The, the glory indicated here, if, if, you, if you look at your Strong's Concordance, goes, um, references the... Um, some honor, some uh, place of power, uh, some um, magnification, if you will, some exaltation, worship, 
Um, and he kind of highlights the Christian goal, if you will, in life in a very, very short sentence of words. It says, Give unto the Lord, ye mighty. So it's calling it's calling upon the mighty, those that those that are um, those are there of strength. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto so worship and praise, and then your physical prowess. He kind of sums up all it is to be a Christian in a hand in a single verse. He tells us that our only goal and purpose, first of all, is to worship, which is what this day is for. Uh, it's a day of rest. Jared uh, talked about rest this morning. Uh, it is a day of, uh, of, of teaching and preaching, but it, it, it is a day that is dedicated to worship. Why do we sing songs at the top of each hour? At the end of the main service, why do we sing specials? Why, why is any of that necessary? Well, song, song singing is a part of worship. It is, it, it is a necessary part of worship. Uh, uh, a, 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 we're in them now, an entire book of the Bible, and actually a very large book of the Bible is dedicated to singing and praising through uh, lyrical poetry. It is, it is, worship is, is so important to the Christian experience because in that we set aside this day specifically to uphold our hands to God and to, and to praise Him for all the things that He's done for us in the past, in, the, in, the, in, our, in our past life, in our past week, in our past day, hours, minutes, and everything that He'll do for us in the future and we, we set aside this small moment of our human experience, which is very limited, to praise Him, which mirrors the, the types of praise that He gets incessantly in heaven. It, 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 is, it is so integral to our experience. And when we look up and we say, uh, you know, uh, Lord, you are to be magnified. Lord, you are the, the, the greatest, the great one, our Redeemer. It is the equivalent of your child coming up to you if, if you're a father or a mother and, and they've, got, they've made a little homemade card that says best mom or best dad ever. And, that, and, and, and the time that they took to, uh, to create that homemade card and, and the expression of love that is found in saying that you're the best is also lets you know that there is an infinite amount of love behind it. And when we say... Dear Lord, you're the best. That by identifying Him in that way, we're saying so much more, and that's what worship is about. It and it strengthens that relationship. If Gracie gives me a card that says I'm the best dad ever, it it lets me know how she views our relationship. It lets me know that she enjoys this relationship. It lets it 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 it, it makes me want to invest more into that relationship. The kind of love that's indicated there, there's so much in that in worship, in saying, uh, uh, thank you, yes. Uh, one of the things, one of the last things that I see that everybody can do. Yeah. I mean, they, they may be a little shy to get up and testify, or, or, but with the whole congregation saying they can, they can fill in and, and praise the Lord. Yes, that, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a both a, a corporate form of worship, uh, something that not only can be done individually. You can, you can get up before the church and sing individually, but you could also sing. We can also sing together. It is, it is the one time during a service when the entire body's voice is heard, or it should be. You should participate in singing. It's important. Uh, and, and that's not, and that's not, you know, you know, to see who who has the best voice in the place. Uh, but you know, one of the I I, I monitor. Uh, if you ever see me with headphones on in in the sound room, I'm, I'm monitoring the audio that's going out to the stream. I can hear everything that's coming through the mic because I got to make sure that it's going through the mic. The other week, I didn't monitor the audio, and I had Brother Larry Sermon muted for half the time. Uh, so you have you have to monitor that audio. And 
Brother Larry singing is the loudest in the bunch. I'm not going to say it's the best in the bunch, but it's the loudest in the bunch. It's, it's, it, 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 is, it is very vocal. But that's not what it's about. It's about that moment of all of us saying, you know, whatever, whatever the message of the song, a uh, uh, sweet hour of prayer, uh, a blessed assurance, uh, amazing grace, us using the message of that song to say, this is all about you, and we can all do that together. The women can do it. The, the, women, the women have a voice in the song service. Uh, uh, it, 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 worship is super important. And then there's the other half of this in the Christian experience, and that is the work part. We're set aside by God to function as a, a vessel of His will. A, we are set aside to use everything that's inside of us to further the cause of Christ and the glory of His kingdom. We're, we're, suppo- we're supposed to always be pulling toward that. Um, you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Your strength. There are, there are men, especially in the New Testament, but also in the Old Testament too, uh, like Paul, who you can see gave their entire, their entire body and their entire strength to the work of the Lord. And, and, and there are, to greater and lesser degrees, you can see throughout the Bible this, but that is our purpose, that is our goal, is worship and work. Enter to worship, depart to serve. Give unto the Lord the glory, do unto His name, worship the Lord in the beauty of His holiness. Now give unto the Lord the glory, do His name, worship the Lord in the beauty of His holiness. So now we begin to prescribe the type of worship that we are to give. It says in in verse 1, it it has a very simple, give glory and strength. It's it's, it's very very open-ended. Verse 2 begins to center in on the, on the scope of the type of worship and glory that we should be giving. The Lord says, Give unto the Lord the glory, do His name. The creator of all the universe, the, uh, the master of all that He surveys, the, uh, the progenitor of all life, the, uh, uh, the redeemer of souls, Is there anything that he cannot do? Is there any place that he cannot go? Is there any thought that is too high for him to have? If you don't know, the answer to those, all those questions is no. That He is infinite and personal all at the same time. And the type of worship that we should have is both infinite as much as we can as often as we can and personal as as intimate as you're speaking with a friend you know if you want to take it down to a human experience we celebrate people one time a year on their birthday we we all sit together and we and we turn to that person. And we say, "We're, we're glad you're around. <laughs> we're, glad, we're, we're glad you made it made it around the sun one more time." Uh, but you know, if it's my birthday, my wife might have something more personal to to give me to tell me. And in a very in a very similar way, but not exactly the same. Our corporate worship is we're all saying. You're great, God. And, and, and we turn to our fellow brother and sister and says, Isn't he great? And they say, Yes. And we're so happy and joyful together in the, in the fellowship and worship there. But then there has to be moments where you go by yourself and you say, I just want to tell you, Lord, how great I think you are. In all facets, the, give him to him the glory that's due his name because he deserves it, because it is, it is his right. Worship the Lord in the beauty of His holiness. Now, in the beauty of perfection. Well, what is His holiness? It's His ability to be 
right and righteous and, and pure and, and the very embodiment of the laws that He has laid down, the, the, the perfect keeper of it all. And He says to worship Him in the beauty of that holy, the, the, the um, intricate perfection. I don't, I don't think that there is a better example. Actually, in fact, I know there's not a better example of the beauty of holiness than to look at the life of Christ. Simple perfection. Unadulterated, unerring, human and godlike perfection. All in one person. And in Jesus we see anger. In Jesus we see love. In Jesus we see mercy. In Jesus we see grace. All of these emotions display, but perfect displays. Was he angry? Yeah. Jesus got angry. Read the passage where he threw all those money changers out of the temple. He was mad that day, but he had a right to be. Perfect anger. The indignation that he felt there could not be assailed by a thousand lawyers. Perfect love. He looked at the woman caught in adultery and said, Go and sin no more. Perfect mercy. When the woman came to him and said, Yea, yeah, Lord, but even the dogs get crumbs from the table. Perfect mercy. Everything about... And, and this perfectness, this un unending and unbelievable ability to maintain holiness, we're supposed to worship the beauty of that. That, that. that should be something, an ideal with which we should uphold and look to at all times. The voice of the Lord it, uh, is upon the waters. The glory of the Lord thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. Now verse 3 shifts away and starts talking about the voice of the Lord. And this is where it says it's comparable. This, this whole thing is comparable to a thunderstorm because it starts on the waters. A lot of the storms and stuff in Israel begin on the Mediterranean Sea, a lot, a lot, like a lot of our storms. A lot of, a lot of the hurricanes and stuff, where do they start? They start out in the Atlantic. Um, and they blow in on top of Florida and Georgia and Mississippi and Alabama, and they roll, and usually we get a nice good heavy torrent as they're, as they're petering out, making their way north. Um, uh, and he says, the, the, the voice of the Lord is upon the, wa is upon the waters. The, glory of the, the God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. Now, this psalm is taking the awesome nature of a storm, the, the unbelievable power that they have. If you've ever seen storm destruction or, or just you know, uh, watched a tornado or a hurricane and just seen the unbelievable abilities that, 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 that they, the, this force of nature has, and not prescribing them their own small deity, not prescribing them to uh, you know, some, uh, some uh, uh, spirits of the earth or whatever, as many pagans have to, but prescribing them to the one that, you know, take, you know when he looks down at a tornado, is just simply twirling his finger, and, 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 and it, it, is, it is nothing to him. He literally calls the wind that is the, the voice, and, and his glory is thunder. And making this comparison, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Now he talks about this voice. He says he's, he, has, he has two different different words here. He uses powerful and full of majesty. Now, powerful, we, we, we can look at a storm and see the power of a storm. Uh, I, I've, I've heard about uh, uh, winds so powerful that they drive uh, pieces of straw into trees. I've seen, I, I, you know, uh, uh, Scotty Richardson's house that used to live next to us there, it lifted it a handful of degrees, turned it, and set it back down perfectly. The power of the wind is, 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 is unmatched and He's making this comparison to the voice of the Lord. Look, look in uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus simply asks one question of those that came to uh, seek Him. He said, Whom seek ye? And 
all of them are, are thrown back by the, by the power of his words. Now that's just sheer force. That's unadulterated energy. That is the same speaking power that said, let there be light. And, and light didn't resist. Light didn't think, I'm, hold on a second, I'm gonna, I'm, I need to think about that. It just was. Which also, when the Lord tells us to do something, should make us quake because the forces of nature instantly obey His will and you are so finitely smaller than the, force, the forces of nature. And yet we have the audacity to say, just hang on a minute, whenever I get ready, if I feel the leading of the Lord, which is usually us, when I feel the leading of myself um, to come do it, and, and, and we're not doing it. So we have the power of the Lord, this, this sheer might and strength, and, but then you have majesty. And majesty holds a whole different... It means, full, it means power too, but it is royal power. It is authority. So not only does he possess all of the all of the the strength, he possesses all the authority in which to place that strength. If a storm comes by a way, it is not it is not by accident. It is not unbidden. It is not, it, 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 everything that he does is by his intention and his design and his will. And you say, well, Brother Adam, storms happen, you know, they, 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 they you know, th things happen as they will. All, everything is designed. You want to know how storms happen? There is an actual scientific reaction on, on, on up currents and downdrafts and all this other stuff that, that creates a storm. And if you don't think that God is not in control of those things, you're, 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 you're smoking something. You're unaware. You're ignorant. Science every day discovers something new, and all they're doing is, is showing you the ways in which God controls nature to, and bends it to His will, the way that He controls you. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. Now, the cedars of Lebanon are famous, especially in the Old Testament. It, they are what made the temple. They were the construction material for the temple, the framework. Tall, powerful, stout trees, legendary in, in the Middle East at that time. Valuable. And it says, The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars, snaps them off. He maketh them to skip like a calf. Lebanon and, and uh, Assyrian like a young unicorn. The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. Now, you see this storm, this metaphorical, or if perhaps the writer of this psalm is looking at the power of a storm coming in from the Mediterranean and saying, I'm beholding a manifestation of the power of God and then begins to write that down as such. And you see it crash into Lebanon and just destroy trees. And it says that it makes them skip like it. It didn't just break them over. You know, I had a treetop, part of my treetop come out of my tree a couple of years ago in a big storm. It's a mess to clean up. But it didn't really cause all that much damage. Landed on my chain link fence and kind of bent it down a little bit. But it, was, it wasn't a big deal. No, this is when it, it, it breaks it off and then it carries it some distance. It says it made it skip like a calf. It, it, it not only broke the trees off, but it has the power and the force to carry it. And it says, the, the voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire and shakes the wilderness. The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calve and discovereth the forest. In his temple doth everyone speak of his glory. Now, how many times, how many storms, you know, winter storms, especially around here, everybody talks about winter storms. You get a winter storm, I work in a barber shop, so you get a winter storm or even, even a, a real good sized thunderstorm, it's the talk of the town for like a week and a half. Everybody that comes in talks about, it. did you get any damage? You know, how, how did things go? You know, did y'all did y'all lose any power? All that other stuff. There's always something. It, it, it is, the, is the talk. And I believe that verse... Uh, um, 
that at verse 9, the end of the verse 9, in his temple doth everyone speak of his glory is a very similar thing. People talk about storms and the power of storms. But the people of Israel and this writer, they know to whom to, to contribute them to. He says, everyone speaks of his glory in his temple. So first, we're re- for the, you know, from, ver- from verse 3 to basically the mid part of verse 9, we're speaking about a, a storm and, and how it is, is related to the power of the Lord. And then it talks about the temple. You don't think that people said, did you see that storm that come through? That was an awesome display of our Lord's power. Now, I, I've been in, I've worked in a barbershop and I've talked to a lot of people for a long time. That has never been the comment that ma- people make about storms. Why? Because, you know, uh, we, well, we can look on Doppler radar and we can see them coming in and, and, and we got storm shelters and everything. And, and we, we, we make finite right. the infinite power, a, a, a minor display of the infinite power of our God. Look at a hurricane on Doppler radar sometime out in the ocean and how massive it is. And that is, the earth is his footstool. Right. <laughs> and how small that is. And we never attribute these things to God. Oh, and, and, and more than that, especially with, 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 you know, in, in reference to the majesty of our God. We never, we never think that storm was for a purpose. It was designed to make those damage, to make that damage, and a lot of people wonder why things go around Stewart County so often. Maybe they're just not designed to come here. You know, the the the, the purpose in these things, the purpose in the power of God. Destruction is not for just destruction's sake. The Lord sitteth upon the flood. The Lord sitteth king forever. The Lord will give strength unto His people. The Lord will bless His people with peace. First, he finishes up, and this is interesting. Look at verse 1. Give unto the Lord, ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Now verse 11. The Lord will give strength unto His people. The Lord will bless His people with peace. We talk, have talked a lot in this class, especially in the last year, year and a half, about reciprocal relationships between Christians and God. You are to dedicate your strength and your ability and your talent to the Lord. If you're a saved person, that's not, that's not an optional thing. That is not, you know, if you decide to, that's not if you want to. That is a, that is, that is a given part of your service. You are bought with a price. You are... I'm going to use a word that people really don't like, a slave. And you're a servant and a slave in the Lord's service. And masters get what they want out of slaves. So verse 1 says, give glory and strength. You're a slave and be happy about it. But verse 11, reciprocal relationship. The Lord will give strength unto his people. Brother Adam, I just can't go another mile. Keep pushing because I know you're at the bottom of your barrel, but you're not at the bottom of his. I'm sure when Elijah showed up on that widow's doorstep and requested the last little bit of cornmeal that she had, with the last two sticks they had to rub together to make a fire, but she said, well, I guess we're doomed. We're at, we are at the end of our rope, but they were not at the end of God's provision. Wherever you think that you're coming to the end of yourself, I promise you there is a well, nay, a mountain of strength left to draw upon. Right. And moreover, especially if you look at, at, the, at the tumultuous nature of this chapter, the way it describes this, massive, powerful storm. It says, the Lord bless His people with peace. Do we live in a peaceful time? Absolutely not. And you'd be crazy to think otherwise. (laughs) We live in one of the most ignorant and controversial days there has probably ever been for mankind. It's right up there. Things will wax worse and worse. But we as saved people, and this is just a promise for saved people, if you're not saved, pray. 
That's all I can tell you. But for saved people, you are promised peace. Now, being promised peace does not mean you're going to have it right here and right now. I have spiritual peace, but let me I'll tell you right now, I worry about stuff every day in the flesh. There is eternal peace that is granted for your service and for your worship. In fact, the amount of peace and glory and, and things that you are granted is proportional, <laughs> literally proportional to how much strength and worship you were able to put out in your life. Peace can be attained spiritually in this life. There's no doubt about it. If, 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 you're, if, if you're worried in the spirit, check your soul because that's, that's, not, that's not where a saved person should be dwelling. That's where we can get. That's not where we should dwell. Any questions on Psalm 29, 1 through 11? Comments? Next week, we venture into the 30s. You are dismissed. <laughs>